the idea that you can be happy no matter what is the foundation of why stoic philosophy is so like self-helpy um, and probably why it's so popular today because it adds a lot of um it adds a lot of utility to an individual's life it's kind of funny how everything in the greek canon seems to be so connected canon <laughs> Like only only a gamer would describe ancient Greek philosophy in terms of oh yeah you know the ancient Greek canon you know the you know it's like the old republic really. Plato was in the academy and he described man as a featherless biped, and so Diogenes went and uh, found a plucked chicken and then threw it onto the floor of the academy and uh, said behold a man. So this is Diagnes. He's like the world's first troll. Uh, the Schopenhauer is uh, a very sad boy. Very sad boy. So, so cynical, in fact, that his own mother wrote a letter saying that she could not bear how cynical he is. So PewDiePie actually just released a video about philosophy, which I thought was really cool because he's done this once before about Plato's Republic and, you know, his book reviews. And this time it was Epictetus, a famous Stoic philosopher. Actually, a really good Stoic philosopher as well. And probably the one that would be most recommended, um, I think, in Stoicism as one of the best representations of Stoicism, Epictetus and Cicero. I think that it was probably one of the harder books to start with. I think that I probably would have started a, a layperson on Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, maybe, as an introduction to Stoicism, but it's a solid book nonetheless. So what we're going to go through is how he describes Stoicism, whether it's a good representation of the philosophy, and uh, anything that we can add. Um, PewDiePie usually has some pretty high quality videos, and I'm really excited to see what he's going to say. So the video is this one. Bang. I read a book. It's, uh, it's actually more than, than I have. And I don't, I don't normally do that. Uh, it's actually somewhat an impressive feat to be entirely honest with you, especially since Epictetus actually is, uh, like, I think the Stoics are quite nice to read, but, uh, it's not like the easiest stuff to read. So I think that's actually really impressive. And I think that we should all, you know, give, uh, PewDiePie the big ups for getting into philosophy. Well done, man. Merce. I hold before you the cutie pie shaker. It's now available. So I make a cool effect. This is my favorite one, so... Why was that so good? <laughs> Bar. Nice job, team. <sighs> That's something, Finta. These bad boys get sold out quick, so if you want one, don't wait. Link it to the aid script. Eh. Ugh. And another reason, if you're not sold yet, despite the fact that this is the best cup in the world, they sold out quickly. 30% off if you use code PewDiePie. 30%? If there's ever a time to be like, hey, if you uh, now, now's the time, gamers. Now, you want to be better at games or what? I feel, I feel like I've, I do, do I need to buy a cup now? Does that like? Can't you tell how good I am at games? It's only valid as long as the supply lasts. Don't be one of these people that wait for the supply to unlast itself. Shaker is nine ninety nine. But well, wait a minute. Does that desire record to nature? I want to know. I want to know, if PewDiePie. Isn't that actively distribute, like, shouldn't we as students of Epictetus be promoting the rational life and be indifferent to those desires from which the body would seek? Come on, man. I'm sorry. Discourses on the I'm selected writings late. of Epicurus. I am so late. I've been busy, okay? I also planned this very, very poorly, okay? <laughs> uh, we read Epictetus discourses and selected writings. Did you love it? Did you hate it? What would you rate it? Not many people complained that I was so late, so I assume no one read it. <laughs> <laughs> the five people that actually did be like, bruh. Can you say epic titties without giggling like a schoolgirl? It's got epic and tits in it. That's hilarious. This is, this is true. I'm not going to lie. I do laugh most of the time. And I've been doing philosophy for like eight plus years now, so. I picked this book because it's fairly simple, it's straightforward, and it's a good introduction to Stoic philosophy. Um, I would probably disagree. I think that Epictetus is one of probably, I wouldn't say it's the harder, um, one of the harder thinkers, but I think that as an introduction to Stoicism, it's not the easiest. I think I would have probably 
promoted something like Marcus Aurelius's meditations as being the most layperson friendly. Like, I think it's genuinely like the most simple and clear explanation of Stoicism in a way that is very easy to digest. It's the meditations of Marcus Aurelius of how he's living his life and how he thinks we should live our lives. Rather than Epic Epictetus actually making a lot of claims about how Stoicism actually works. Um, I think it's probably a better representation of Stoicism, like genuinely better, but not easier. Um, definitely would recommend Marcus Aurelius first. Seneca is uh, also also great. Yeah, that's actually, that's true. And Cic Cicero. Um, so yeah. <laughs> um, there's probably better examples, but this is what I chose. I really, really like this book. Um, it's one of the few books that make me feel fortunate as a... Sounds a bit cringe almost to say, but fortunate as a human to be able to experience. I why do you why do you feel fortunate as a human? The 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 I guess the the, the idea of Epictetus is that um, it's the the rationality that, that are within us that makes life worth living. You know um, that you can be happy no matter what, and I think that is the the idea that you can be happy no matter what is the foundation of why Stoic philosophy is so like self helpy, um, and probably why it's so popular today because it adds a lot of um, it adds a lot of utility to an individual's life. It makes it easier uh, for an individual to cope with tragedy and uh, hardship from which they face. And I think that's why it's so popular today. I, I really mean that. I don't care if it's cringe, actually. Not just for its content, but also the fact that it did survive, which is not to be taken for granted. Earlier works of Stoics like uh, Chrysippus didn't survive. And this has been around for 2000 years, so... That's great. It was written by Aaron, who was Epictetus' student, and he wrote down his teacher's words, word for word. And I assumed he just thought, hey, this is epic. I'm going to write this down. Other people might have some use of this. Uh, fun fact, Aaron also wrote Alexander the Great's autobiography. I did not know that. It's kind of funny how everything in the Greek canon seems to be so connected. I said this before, but yeah, and you probably know. Um, <laughs> I like the use of the word canon. <laughs> like this is the Greek canon. <laughs> like only only a gamer would describe ancient Greek philosophy in terms of oh yeah, you know the ancient Greek canon. You know the you know it's like the old Republic really. Plato learned from Socrates. And Aristotle studied in a Plato school. Alexander the Great was taught by Aristotle. It's just. And in this book is, and I think like if we consider like if we consider the the whole point of this like list, right? So you've got like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Aristotle is probably one of the biggest um, influences. These two are probably the biggest influences um, upon Epictetus. Um, Epictetus and his disdain for the body pretty much comes from Plato. Um, you can hear, uh, you know, like basically the Phaedo uh, within. Um, Epictetus's work. Uh, essentially, Epictetus refers to the body as like pathetic little flesh, um, as uh, molded clay. He refers to it with disdain. He, he thinks that our desires when we engage in the world um, are ultimately restrictions of our freedom. And freedom really comes through accordance with nature. And nature is order, which is connected with Zeus, and so is discoverable through pure rationality. And so virtue and happiness really uh, exist in accordance with rationality for Epictetus. It's all about living the rational life. That being said, we should engage in trying to, you know, fulfill our needs, um, which are indifferent, you know, our desires within the world, which are indifferent in order to, you know, continue this, uh, you know, this, uh, si this search for, for happiness within the, um, the understanding and, uh, and uh, like, was it elation we get from observing reality and the order that is being, you know, created by the gods or created by God, because uh, Zeus is really um, fundamental in this. And the most of the Greeks took Zeus to be the god of uh, the god which created the world and gave order to things. Um, Parmenides connecting it with, um, you know, the, the the god of night, Nyx, um, and there's a there's a fundamental understanding that there is a logos, um, an order inherent within being itself that is being determined by, um, by what well, that is determined within nature, 
but it's also been determined by by the gods in this case with Epictetus. Um, in the terms of Aristotle, Aristotle was the first really to show that an end was a very important aspect to an individual's life. So like the telos, so that we are actually moving towards and seeking something, like we are actually trying to achieve something. And that that's really important for Epictetus because it's more of the direction and flow of our lives are what we are, are considering here. And that that's uh, something that's a byproduct of Aristotle. Aristotle um, influenced who um, is very important to Stoicism, a man called Ep Epicurus. Um, Epicurus believed um, he was the, basically the first minimalist. Um, he believed in the, the, the cessation and the minimalization of desires, splitting desires into three separate categories, natural, uh, natural and necessary, natural but unnecessary, and unnatural and unnecessary. Essentially, that which is natural and necessary are what we you know, engage towards, that which, is, um, that which is natural but unnecessary is acceptable at times, and uh, unnatural and unnecessary just needs to be you know, eliminated. And he famously said, um, you know, you need to eat fish. You need to eat, but you don't need to eat fish. You don't need to eat fish. <laughs> and, and the reason that's so important um, is because uh, Epicurus sees Aristotle um, and takes it and runs with it to this conception of pleasure and pain and sees that we're being ruled by pleasure and pain. And so in life, we are seeking pleasure and the elimination of pain and then moves basically towards like what we are really seeking is the elimination of pain. And so if we reduce our desires we will feel less pain, okay? Which is kind of why stoicism is so, you know, fixated on, you know, trying to find happiness. Like Epicurus basically says you could be happy even while being tortured, um, which Aristotle categorically rejects. <laughs> Stoics are more like Epicurus, but reject the idea that we are seeking pleasure. Instead, like Aristotle, they take an end to be something more akin with nature. So, um, Epictetus understood that we are seeking that which is uh, in accordance with nature and we do so through reason and so like Plato um, takes the the good life to be the purely rational life and so that all we seek in terms of uh, what is good is the virtues so they do, they only see the virtues as good there is nothing outside of that as good. Everything else is indifferent. So any physical pleasure, any experiences you have in the world are indifferent to Epictetus. It doesn't matter. The only reason it does matter is in this relation to how we engage towards the rational life and obviously try to engage others towards the rational life. Uh, and that's, um, that's essentially what you need to remember with um, Epictetus and how it kind of philosophically ties in together. So... Epictetus and the other Stoics are very influenced by Epicurus, um, who I would heavily recommend, who was heavily influenced by Aristotle and who was heavily influenced by Plato. And obviously most of these thinkers have read Plato. They're very influenced by Plato and Parmenides. This idea that there is a foundational order to reality and that reason itself is separate from the body. So there's this very clear mind-body-soul distinction, uh, which is uh, clear in Plato, but also is quite distinct in Epic Epictetus. Alexander the Great was taught by Aristotle. It's just... And in this book as well, there's many great anecdotes from Diogenes, which I made a video about as well, which was unexpected and really, really fun. So the more you dwell into it, the more you get out of it. And I really love that. And the reason I brought this up as well is because Stoicism takes its roots or its beginnings around the time of Aristotle's death. And it heavily derives from Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. But I would say the main difference, there are obviously a couple, is that uh, Stoicism is philosophy more as a way of life. I've explained this before, but... That's very true. Um, very famously, Marcus Aurelius says, stop asking how to be a good man and be one. The general explanation I hear about what Stoicism is, it's become fairly popular recently is that there are things in life that you can control and there are things in life that you can't control and whatever you can't control you shouldn't let bother you they shouldn't uh, make you feel angry or sad and i think that's a 
good example because it's something that most people can relate to already or you've taken this into practice maybe without naturally without even thinking about it it's easier to cope or deal with things if we recognize well this is out of my control i can't do anything about about it if of course they see that um in reality what we can and cannot control really boils down to our application of reason um what we can control is our reason and rationality which is very much like the platonic view of things this understanding that what what we are really is the the charioteer um or we are the the mind behind the body the soul within the body we aren't um an understanding of a body uh and mind relationship so we'll never actually feel at home in our desires so when we actually desire something in the world and we try to achieve it we are furthering our um, further alienating ourselves from the possibility of happiness um in a stoic understanding of reality if you miss the bus one day maybe you think instead of getting upset about it you can try and appreciate getting a good walk positive thinking everyone uh that's not really stoicism but it, i mean in a sense stoicism is that for everything which sometimes might seem yeah like as in you could be getting tortured right now and be happy and because in reality all of those pleasures and pains from which you um consider valuable you are mistaking about you are mistaken about their value and in fact the only thing that is valuable is virtue and reason so as long as you're being rational while you're being tortured in theory you're going to be okay and this is um you know this uh this distinction of like in stoicism really about how to um cope it's a really big understanding of stoicism is it's really like a coping method with um the suffering in life and i think that's really partly about the the pains in which individuals faced in in rome and this is why hegel sees stoicism as actually a response to the conditions from which people lived in at the time um people were feeling very alienated um when they sought their desires it was only causing them more suffering and the more they wanted the the worse things got and obviously there was quite a big gap in terms of um living standard in ancient rome uh, especially since they had a very large slave class um and um a very wealthy um aristocratic class um you know the roman empire was built upon the work of the gauls who were you know uh, for well not just the gauls but like you know slaves for, throughout who were um wouldn't have been gauls at this time actually i don't think but um no would it no um who were were you know basically building the roads and the infrastructure uh, and so on so that they could actually um really um extract as much uh, value from the slaves as possible so that some people could live lives of absolute luxury for example slaves weren't even spoken to uh you would just like if you wanted to get something from a slave you would raise your glass and epictetus uh, was a slave and so it's really quite fitting that marcus aurelius who um loved the work of epictetus and described himself as a pupil of epictetus um although he wasn't actually taught by him um was the emperor of rome and perhaps one of the greatest emperors of rome because he wasn't so overly ambitious and usually put duty before um and, and responsibility before you know personal uh personal desires theme is a bit extreme but it's also in every sense necessary to be free as an individual to be truly free which we'll get into later i think these smaller examples are good and but be truly free is really just reason like pure reason in and of itself like um the rejection of those um material understandings of reality and the movement to the purely rational conception of reality um and that's very platonic if we would let any single thing that doesn't go our way bother us then we would just live life in constant distress and according to epictetus being angry or feeling sorrow are just not useful emotions because he says when did anger however ever teach someone to play music or pilot a ship do you imagine that anger is going to help teach me the far more complex business of life well it won't uh and this is really actually a, a great point when he says like useful um epictetus takes emotions to be um not you shouldn't be like unfeeling like a statue i think he says but rather um you use your emotions to essentially dispose you towards the rational life so for example when you start to engage in ethics for epictetus you should feel regret 
um, of from the life that you've lived so that it motivates you towards the rational life. Um, you should also try and have appropriate respons responses to situations which, are, which um, you know, essentially align with nature. So, for example, if you are, um, you know, a parent, you should be loving to your child. If you are, you know, um, you should, but at the same time, you shouldn't let anything uh, essentially conflict with your goals of rationality. And you should remember that everything is finite and indif and be indifferent to everything. So love your children, but remember they're going to die is like a big thing. Um, because it's like, yes, you do, you will, you do love them, but nature has accorded that their deaths will occur. And so um, be loving towards them as a parent should be in terms of propriety. But that is a proper emotional disposition that is determined in reflection of nature and not something that is, you know, um, good in and of itself. It's good because it aligns and accords with the rational life. And um, the same with trying to motivate people, other people to be rational and fulfill their needs. If you help someone fulfill their needs, um, you aren't doing it because it's good to fulfill their needs. You should be indifferent to their needs, but their needs are useful for them to achieve the rational life. And so you help fulfill their needs uh, in order so that they can go on towards reason. Um, so in the sense that there are things in life that we can and we can't control, uh, the book actually starts off in book one discourses with concerning what is in our power and what is not. And Epictetus begins to explain that we naturally unbound ourselves to things, bound to these headphones for seemingly no reason, but wanting to cover up my hair. Uh, I'm, <laughs> fuck. I'm bound to this camera because uh, I needed to film this video. I'm bound to... See, that, I know those lockdown feels, man, but you've got to remember that it doesn't accord with the rational life, and so you should be indifferent. The computer. I'm bound to this desk in this chair. This is where the whole floor gang meme come from. I don't need it, technically. But also, we bound ourselves to maybe even other people, friends and uh, family and our children. We see them as sort of an extension of ourselves. But according to Epictetus, because we bound ourselves to many things, they depress us and they weigh us down. And he starts off by giving a smaller example. If we want to sail and we look out to the sea and the wind isn't blowing in our favor, we look out to sea and torment ourselves, hoping that the wind will change again. Uh, but what really is it to us? It is not in our power to control nature. And, and these things that we bound ourselves to, we sort of feel a sense of ownership of, but we don't own any of it. You may think you own your house, but at any point, um, I mean, unlikely, but it could get destroyed. Your friends and family could pass away at any moment, and so can you. Uh, or they could leave, and so can you. And um, it goes as far as even your own body doesn't belong to you, because as you may control, control it in a sense, you also can't control it being in perfect health, you can make it. And there's there's also kind of a disdain for the body um, in some respects, um, although almost like a respect in the sense that you need to respect your body to preserve, uh, you know, the rational pursuit of things. But what matters is your mind. What matters what you are is your reason. And um, this is a very alienating philosophy in many ways. And although it helps as a coping mechanism, it really doesn't allow for the expression of the individual's will um, beyond the rejection of all of their desires. So this is this philosophy is based fundamentally um, upon the cessation of desire, removing as much desire as, uh, as possible, which is why the the praise a very minimalist lifestyle. The what they what they desire is the rational life, pure and simple, and the engagement and elation at the order of the universe, and not that which is, you know, physically um, fulfilling. This is why Hegel sees it as a um, unhappy consciousness. He describes the Stoics as the unhappy consciousness. The, the Stoics have, um, have no content to their desires, essentially. They alienate everything that could be the content of their desires in terms of what they would actually want uh, in accordance with like being a, a human, like the, the expression of their desires in the world, they try to eliminate them as much as possible and eliminate the expression of their will down to the smallest possible, uh, like the most minimal expressions of those things. And it's very much based on a very Socratic 
understanding of things that he who was happiest with the he who was content with the least is the happiest um this is somewhat you know advantageous it, it means that you can't be frustrated that you can't control reality as he says it means that you um have greater self-discipline and self-control and on you know controlled by your desires but it also doesn't give you the ability to control your desires you know to to essentially decide what is worth desiring uh to act in a world that would be rational and in fact when you're engaged in reality the reason that they see it as indifferent is because they don't really see you as being able to express freedom in your actions freedoms only in a mental state and in, 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 a, in an understanding in a, in a very philosophical in the philosophical pursuit of things and so when we talk about you know how you should live your life stoics are quite i don't want to say like like you, i, I don't want to say like quite um solemn but they are quite solemn in the sense that there's very, very little that you can actually get out of stoicism in terms of achieving any sort of happiness beyond a rational conception of things and many i think i think hegel especially but many philosophers see it as a as a alienation of those desires that would have would be rational would be rationally expressed so when we talk about you know like expressing like you know trying to eat something that would bring us like you know a level of pleasure and seeing that pleasure is good they would not associate pleasure as good they would not see pain as bad necessarily um which kind of begs the question is what they take nature to be and why they where they take value to come from and why and the the only real explanation from this is a very platonic dialogue from which they refer to things which are transcendent um and this transcendence from reality seems to hegel to be almost a, an attempt at escaping the conditions from which they are living in they are trying to alienate their current desires because of the conditions from which they are living in uh, mean that they can never express a level of happiness in the world they're in which would not be surprising for a world uh you know uh fulfilled by a huge slave class so and and then obviously in terms of uh even in the roman aristocracy it was incredibly competitive it was uh, based around glory and um people were very foolhardy and um essentially um i don't want to say self-absorbed because individualism wasn't really a prominent understanding but very um very absorbed in their 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 desires and so this was a very reactionary philosophy i would argue um useful um it can teach well a lot but i think it goes to an extreme in which it alienates all of the pleasures of the flesh and even alienates the avoidance of the pains beyond the engagement in that which is rational perform exactly as you wish so from that logic it doesn't belong to you and this is easier to see with smaller things like okay i don't own this book uh sure <laughs> but it's important to grasp for everything not just to avoid sorrow and pain but to also to develop your own personal freedom which is my favorite part of the book and uh, a surprising piece that really yeah we'll get into that later so just because we can't control these things or the outcome of them that doesn't mean you can en can't enjoy them or that you can't participate or even influence the world uh it's rather recognizing that that's a difficult thing to do uh changing people's minds for example but i would i would say that like their their understanding of the world in general and whether you should like why you would you know try and change the word and, uh, world and enjoy these things it's it's about an indifference it's like yeah you can but that's not what's good what's good is is this rational pursuit it is in harmony with nature i would argue that a stoic even appreciate in a sense things further because they see them for what they really are according to its nature and according to nature is a phrase that you hear a lot of in stoicism a stoic's goal is after all to live life according to nature and to put it simply this means that uh, you see the world for what it is and therefore you accept it you accept age you accept loss you accept death everything from simple to the weather so on this principle of living according to nature you might ask then well why should i just live like whatever i please why should i not just fill myself with food or drink or 
give in to any sensational pleasure that I want. Well, be, that's because we may not control all these other things, but the only thing that we control is our will. And that is what controls our actions. So let's say, for example, crazy example, I enjoy maybe drinking whiskey in the evening. Uh, that might satisfy a desire that you have, but ultimately you are all you are bound to that desire then and according to epictetus we should try and eliminate our desires because otherwise we are bound to them and otherwise our actions is really the only thing that we can control yeah and one of the things that he can what kind of is becomes unbelievably aware is that all of our desires in the world are then restrictions upon our freedom and so what we're actually doing is trying to be as uncaused as possible um, in which we try to alienate all those things which would, you know, confine us and commit us to um, a series of actions in reality in order to obtain some level of uh, physical or, um, you know, um, yeah, like physical like pleasure. And he sees that as a negative. He sees that as an inherent bad. Uh, really, all we need to do is that which is rational. And so when we engage and confine ourselves to this series of actions, when we, we've essentially forfeited our freedom, this is almost like an inability to recognize that you can endorse a given action as being correct and uh, see that as an expression of self-determination. And so if you actually endorse the desire, that desire becomes your desire. And so it's actually an expression of your rational will. They see rationality and and uh, and desires, like rationality and um, those like, like, like in words of like, Plato really talks about like noble and ignoble desires, but reason and desire are very separate um, engagements in reality. Reason and passions, that's it. Uh, you have the rational decision-making process, which you are, and then you have the passions, which kind of corrupt your ability to reason within the world. And so if you engage within the passions, you're actually preventing yourself from engaging in a way that would allow you to seek a higher level of fulfillment in understanding reality as it is. And so you are, conf you are confining yourself to this, you know, mortal flesh, this pathetic little flesh. Bomb with the new flesh. From which you should seek to, you know, abstain from, which is why Plato even sees death as a form of freedom. You, you, your soul escapes this mortal confinement, and he sees the body as a prison. And this is something that um, Epictetus and other Stoics um, inherited from Plato. I'm trying to think, um, there was something else that I think he said there that was important. This idea of, um, I think there's an idea, idea of maturity that's uh, kind of in this acceptance of the way things are as well, that you are being mature when you accept nature. You're accepting that there are things you can control and things that you can't control, and control only that which you can. And that's something that is very present in Marcus Aurelius as well, who, um, you know, basically says, um, all you can control is your mind. And that is essentially um, what you should focus on. Was it know this, all you can control is your, your mind, know this and it will give you strength. And that's what they focus on. This idea of self-discipline within the mind and controlling your desires to enable the maximum amount of freedom. The issue is, is it also confines your freedom because it re prevents you from acting within the world because you can't rationally endorse any given desire, which is why someone like Hegel would say that, look, we shouldn't engage in the total removal of desire, but seek only to engage in those rational desires, those second order desires, those desires from which we would go, actually, that's a good thing to do. It will lead to good consequences. It will lead to, it, it is um, good for everyone if we do that. In book one, there's a really good quote. It says, I must die. Must I then die lamenting? I must be put in chains. Must I then also lament? I must go into exile. Does any man then hinder me from going with smiles and cheerfulness and contentment? Tell me the secret which you possess. I will not, for this is in my power. But I will put you in chains. Man, what are you talking about? Me in chains? You may fatter my leg, but my will, not even Zeus himself, can overpower. So again, whatever is in our own. This a kinship with Zeus, uh, this like uh, kinship with Zeus, this like um, holding something in common to Zeus is very important in Epictetus. It's as if we have been given an aspect of God himself um, when we, in terms of the will, in terms of our engagement in reality. 
And it's also important to recognize that the gods are held to reason uh, just as much as uh, we are. Like this idea of them being, you know, powerful, well, they are just as confined to reason as anything else. And so this accordance with nature and this natural order um, is is something that is um, from which we can admire as an aspect of the gods, but God himself, um, Zeus himself, is uh, confined to, to a rational engagement in, in reality. And we partake in that. And so there is this, uh, and this is something that he also kind of, uh, you know, uh, is inspired by Plato as well. Plato talks about this as in the Phaedrus, uh, this idea of uh, the soul is elevated to the point of the celestial beings in which it sees all of the orders of the immortals being led uh, by Zeus in which you join and then you you know you reach the point in, t in which you you know atop at the uh, at atop of the spheres and look down upon the world of forms and see everything from which it is you know this is the elevation to reason like reason in its pure form and then you can turn and look at the thing itself like the universal one um, and see the intangible uh, was it the intangible essence of reality and um, you know, gain a level of, of understanding of that. Um, and then obviously then return back to the to the world as it is, not in the sense of going back to the to the mortal world, which he sees as dead and um, and uh, incapable of truth. But instead, truth exists in this world of forms, in the universals. Truth exists in Epictetus, in nature, in the order within like in within being itself and that's really what you need to get from this the elevation of reason above the physical passions um reason is happiness reason leads to happiness and only through the rational engagement in reality can we discover the virtues and seek and express those virtues in action whilst the the actual outcomes those physical uh the physical experiences in the world and so on or indifferent to this path of happiness. Own action is what we ultimately have power over or ownership of. And, and no one, not even the gods, in a sense, can take that away from us. This is, according to Epictetus, the most supreme gift that we are given as humans. And uh, it's the only thing that we have that examines itself, what it is and, and what power it has. And through our will and developing of reason, which we gain when we get older, we see things differently and we act differently because of it. Some people can live life without being disturbed by certain events, other people struggle more or less. And what action we take through an, an event is through our opinion of that thing. He gives the example here of Achilles. This then was the cause of Achilles' lamentations. Not the fact that Patroclus died, since other people don't carry on so when a friend or companion dies, but the fact that he chose to lament. So this example is from Homer's Iliad where Achilles uh, lost his best friend Patroclus. You may have heard of, you probably know Achilles already. And he's, he's famous for being this ultimate warrior and the only weakness he had was his heel. Uh, but I, I guess you could say that according to Epictetus, his weakness wasn't uh, his heel, but his opinion that it, that was his fault. Because his view on, on death was not according to nature. And he gives uh, another great quote that sort of ties into that. Because this might, I recognize this might seem very harsh or... or um, crude to impose on someone's view on death uh, but <clears> he <throat> says you wish for these things in winter you are a fool so if you wish for your son or your friend when it's not allowed to you you must know that you are wishing for a fig in winter for such as winter is to a fig such is every event which happens from the universe to the things which are taken away according to its nature and further at the times when you are delighted with a thing place before yourself the contrary appearances what harm is it while you are kissing your child to say with a lisping voice, tomorrow you will die, and to a friend also, tomorrow you will go, or I shall, and never shall we see one another again. Again, according to Epictetus, anger and, and sorrow are just emotions that will not help us through life. And it's not to suppress these emotions and sort of hold them in, but it's rather by seeing things for what they are, you accept them instead of trying to fight it or bark. And I think that is actually a very important lesson to learn from Stoicism in a way that we can genuinely help and, and cope with the, the, the pains and tragedies of life. Um, and I think that that can't be undermined. I think that the understanding that 
an individual can be happy regardless of the circumstances could be argued to be naive though and that's exactly what aristotle kind of argues anyway aristotle says that those who consider that you know you can be happy upon the rack are um are fools he basically says that look you cannot be happy while you're being tortured if you think that then you've clearly misunderstood what torture is and you've clearly misunderstood what value is in life this idea of happiness for aristotle is very much connected with our experiences and he ties it also into nature it's just nature is not merely rational it's this encompassment of the reason and the body together we are hylomorphic we are material and you know soul combined we aren't merely um you know the 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 rational uh, thought process that you know dictates our actions we are also the experiences of pain and pleasure and value within reality and so when we talk about you know trying to express our freedom in terms of a hegelian or aristotelian model of that understanding of how to achieve the good life it's always got to take into consideration those values from which we actually experience within the world that we would be irrational if we didn't uh, seek to avoid torture or you know seek to uh, obtain certain pleasures we should engage towards happiness but we should also be rational about which desires we choose to endorse and we should seek those virtues in order to understand what desires we should endorse arguing with it arguing against nature is something that you do as a child because you haven't yet developed that reason and and only a child would ask for a fig in winter a stoic is always aware of death they sort of live you could, i guess you could say near death so by seeing thing according to its nature that opinion of death might seem heavy or, or overbearing almost uh, to be constantly aware of it but it's also very liberating epictetus gives the example of diogenes as a man who was truly free because everything he owned he could dispose of and was only temporarily a diogenes lived in a barrel <laughs> okay so i want everyone to realize that diogenes lived in a barrel um he um he was actually uh there's actually a funny story about diogenes there's a few actually there's one where he was uh, essentially um having too much of a good time in a public place we could say on the steps uh like the, the the steps leading up to the marketplace in athens um and people were like walking past like disgusted you know like what are you doing and uh someone comes up to him and says what are you doing he's like if only i could rub my belly and it would take away my hunger um there's other there's other quotes uh like so for example alexander the great was triumphing you know he's like walking through the streets of the areas from which he owned and uh as he's coming through athens um he's heard about this diogenes and so he comes up to him and uh, uh he, he sees diogenes and he's sunbathing and he's got his hands behind his head you know and uh he says hello you know i i'm uh, is there anything i can do for you bear in mind this is the most powerful man in the world <laughs> right so uh, alexander the great uh, he says hello is there anything i can do for you he goes yes you can move out the way of the sun <laughs> Um, and he laughed and he says, if I, w if I was to be anyone, if I was to be anyone other than Alexander, I would want to be Diogenes. And um, there's another occasion where Diogenes was, um, where Plato was in the academy and he described man as a featherless biped. And so Diogenes went and uh, found a plucked chicken and then threw it onto the floor of the academy and uh, said, behold, a man. So this is Diagnes. He's like the world's first troll. Um, so yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, Diagnes is a funny character. And yeah, he was heavily admired by like the minimalists, the minimalist kind of philosophers, the Epicureans and the, the Stoics. Attached to him. Uh, he says, if you grabbed him by the leg, he would have given up the leg. If you had seized his entire body, the entire body would have been sacrificed. The same with family, friends, and country. He knew where they had come from, from whom, and on what terms. So Diogenes knew that these things didn't belong to him, so he was also then free from them, while still being able to enjoy them. <laughs> if you imagine a free person, you might imagine someone with a lot of wealth, a lot of power, 
Uh, they can do what they want. They can go wherever they want. And that's because you'd be imagining freedom in a positive sense, getting what you want. The Stoics imagine freedom in a negative sense, you know, not being controlled or being uncaused. Uh, they can control people, but you could still argue that they are humble to their wealth. Uh, money can give freedom, but they can also bound you to it. And then ultimately, in that same sense, being a slave to it. Because if something were to happen with it, and if you're, or if you're awake at night worried that something might happen to all the money you have, you then also don't have an opinion according to its nature, and you are also not free from it. Epictetus himself was a slave during his life, so he must have thought about this a lot uh, on the theme of freedom. And I think he knew that his opinion was not a popular one. He says that he, if you tell someone that they are just as enslaved as someone sold to captivity, don't expect anything but a punch in the nose. <laughs> and I think it's a reality that we don't like to admit. Uh, we prefer to see ourselves as free individuals, even if it might seem like we are or but in general, we are all bound to certain things. So from a stoic sense, you are not. We sometimes even let our actions be bound to not things, but the opinion that other people have of it. Maybe you picked your job or your school or your partner through opinion. Aren't you a slave to other people's opinion then? So according to Epictetus, you can be a slave, but still be a free man. As long as your actions are free and as long as you're not bound to anything. Which is kind of why it seems to be a reactionary uh, philosophy to the conditions of the time in some respects. Um, but also very much uh, influenced by a platonic and uh, epicurean foundation. That's what really makes the difference. And I think that's a, a hopeful and liberating view on the world, I would say. Um, life is just full of things that you can't control. But to try and focus on your own views and your own opinions to liberate yourself, there's, to me, a lot of power in that. There are so many great pieces of this book, and I feel like I could just read quote after quote after quote until I just read the whole book. I the, the, That is probably one of the greatest uh, things about the, the Stoics, is that they're in incredibly quotable. Like, there are, like, accounts dedicated just to, like, writing up quotes from the Stoics, because the, the sound's so nice and the sound's so deep and philosophical. Um, the Stoics do have a beautiful philosophy and a lovely aesthetic, actually. Um, I think that the way of life, though, is somewhat um, restrictive, overly restrictive, uh, unnecessarily restrictive, uh, to the point in which you would actually limit and harm yourself in order to achieve an abstract goal of freedom, which is essentially to become something that which is closer to a conception of Brahman than, than any real human could actually achieve. I highly recommend it. It's just filled with so many great parts. I wanted to finish by reading just uh, my favorite bit, which is just a small sentence in, in the very, very end, because it, it resonates heavily with me. Let someone point out to me a man who can say, I care only about the things which are my own, the things which are not subject of hindrance, the things which are by nature free. This I hold to be the nature of the good, but let all other things be as they are allowed. I do not concern myself. That's it. Epictetus Discourse and Selector Writing check it out what did you think of it did you read it i would love to hear your guys thoughts and uh, did you get the same ideas from me that i had or something completely different uh next week uh it will not be next week but next book we're gonna arthur schopenhauer my arch nemesis no no like hegel's arch nemesis pretty much um I'm gonna read arthur schopenhauer uh, Sch the schopenhauer is uh a very sad boy uh you'll find he is the saddest of the boys as in everything in life is 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 just bad really um freedom is impossible for schopenhauer funnily enough moving from the epicure epicure uh, epictetus where like freedom is fundamental and unavoidable you cannot be t your freedom cannot be taken away from you uh schopenhauer uh basically argues that there is no freedom <laughs> um that it's uh, metaphysically impossible, <laughs> actually, to be free. Um, that your desires will always rule you. And I think, I'm not sure, if, I don't know if this is the correct way of describing it. I think that he describes the, the feeling that you get uh, in terms of depression after masturbation as the devil's laughter. Um, and essentially argues that it is the realization that you will always be a slave to your biology. So... 
um, Schopenhauer is a very sad boy. Um, very sad boy. So, so cynical, in fact, that his own mother wrote a letter saying that she could not bear how cynical he is. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> he's, um, he lived a very uh, secluded life. I, I would argue that he's basically the, like, the most incel philosopher ever, but he was actually voluntarily cel cel celibate. Um, but kind of really looked down upon uh, those things. Um, so, yeah. They, Schopenhauer is, is, is a sad boy. <laughs> of life i recently discovered schopenhauer he's great really fun to read and i think you guys will enjoy him as well if you enjoy philosophy or reading in general it's a fun one i like it he's a goofy guy and that's it hope you guys enjoyed see you next time bye bye i think that pewdiepie did a really good job there i think that he explained epictetus really well um i hope i've added some value to an understanding of the stoics uh from that position uh i think stoicism is best understood after you've read some Plato and I know that he has read some Plato in terms of the Republic so I think that at least a bit of Plato some Aristotle and ideally some Epicurus and this idea of trying to limit your desires is vitally important um to to uh to the Stoics <laughs> no I think I think it's I think it's really great that, that PewDiePie is trying to engage people in philosophy I don't know how good it's going to be to engage, engage people to read Arthur Schopenhauer um but you know, I think the Stoicism is like at least at least a good philosophy. I think that ultimately it's it's not the best philosophy. It's not the philosophy that I would choose to to promote necessarily. But it's a philosophy that I think that everyone should read for the for their own benefit because I think it yes, teaches ah oh god dear god, I think it teaches a level of maturity and freedom towards life. Um, teaches the importance of you know not giving in to one's desires when it may just feel like you are obtaining some level of goodness from it. But in reality, you're actually restraining yourself to what could be an irrational goal. I just think that we need to be more rational about our desires and not always reject our desires for the sake of rationality. That we don't necessarily need to have this dichotomy between the passions and reason. love your children but remember they're going to die.